Um, our next lecture has certain risks. Um, it has more risks, actually. It's uh, called Planes and Chips and Saving Lives. It's uh, how soft and hardware can actually play a key role in saving lives at sea and why Frontex uh, doesn't like it. It's uh, done by Trollofix, Nick and Ruben. And what is following is actually a talk that's once again about a very serious moral and ethical dilemma. Um, since the death rate at the European sea border reached an historical record this year, uh, in September, one out of five people actually who left Libya on a fine wanky boat uh, drowned in September. So the main reason for the increasing of this death rate is actually the crackdown on sea rescue operations by European authorities. Since no rescue coordination center clearly takes responsibility currently, then the technical means of communication, of course, do play a key role in the efforts to coordinate rescues. And in the future, and that's what my friends here are going to explain you, is that a civil society-run maritime rescue coordination center could help to reduce the death of sea significantly. This talk, this talk focuses then on the soft and hardware components that are necessary to challenge European deadly border policy. So give them a warm applause. They will pre present us some potential solutions to fulfill this ambition. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks a lot for joining. Uh, great to have you all here because we need you all um, to solve this problem on the Mediterranean Sea we are going to talk about. My name is Ruben, that is Nick, and this is Trollofix. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, uh, we are going to talk about um, planes and ships and saving lives, and especially how this uh, comes together with um, people that are uh, competent in IT technology, that are competent in hardware um, technology, and why this is so much needed currently on the Mediterranean Sea. Me personally, I'm not a nerd at all, so I have basically no idea um, about computers. Um, I need my house nerds like Nick to help me encrypting my computer and my emails, um, which is also pretty important in this time for sea rescue, and I will tell you why um, uh, shortly. So I'm basically giving you a short introduction uh, into the situation on the Mediterranean Sea, and afterwards, those people are who are much more competent in uh, IT technology and hardware, um, we'll talk about the solutions we need at sea for saving lives. So basically, what is the problem? People are in distress at sea. This is a picture taken from our surveillance aircraft Moonbird. There's a rubber boat which is um, sinking and taking water. This is a situation we might currently have north of Al Khums, which is a Libyan town um, at the so-called uh, European border. I mean, it's um, the Mediterranean Sea, which is basically the border of the European Union. People start in Libya, try to cross um, the Mediterranean Sea via boat because there's no safe and legal alternatives. And so they are ending up in such kind of situations. If the talk is a bit chaotic at some points, it might have to do with the fact that we are currently in operation with our ship. And so there was not much time to prepare because still people are stranded on our boat. But I will talk about that um, a bit later. So we have this uh, situation which with people in distress. So what would you normally expect that's going to happen? Well, if you are white and if you have a European passport and you get in distress some 100 meter um, out of a yacht port uh, in Germany, that's going to happen. However, if you are not holding a European passport and if you are trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea and you get in distress, Maybe that's going to happen. Because, basically, the reaction of the European Union onto distress cases at sea looks like this. 
There's simply nothing. So what we were thinking about some years ago, when the death toll on the Mediterranean Sea was on the rise, um, what can we do if people try to cross the Mediterranean Sea and risk their lives in totally unseaworthy old fishing cutters? So we had the idea that there was a solution to this. And so we also bought an old and unseaworthy fishing cutter. Um, which we then uh, turned uh, into the Sea Watch 1, which was the first um, rescue ship coming from Germany to the Mediterranean Sea. However, we called it Sea Watch for a reason. We didn't call it Sea Rescue, for example, because in our view, it's not the obligation of the civil society to solve the problems European state have caused by closing down their border and by denying any legal alternative for people escaping war, terror, or um, other things, um, for example, in Libya. So we thought um, what we still need to do is we need to go there, we need to look into the situation, and um, uh, we need to make sure that no one drowns. So that's basically what we did. And um, we sent down um, the ship to the Mediterranean Sea. And pretty fast, we found a lot of people in distress there, and we had to deal with it. So in the first moment, um, we were pretty overwhelmed. But then what happened, and that was really amazing, uh, was that, that the uh, civil society actually acted. So a lot of um, new NGOs uh, popped up and sent ships to the Mediterranean Sea. And that was something I was honestly impressed by. Because if we think about the European Union, with all the means they have, with ships, with planes, with a lot of money, whatever, we would have never estimated that it would be some Berlin hipsters uh, in their mid-20s to send the most effective asset to defend uh, the human rights on the Mediterranean Sea and to rescue lives. So, but it was not only the Juventa, it was also, for example, Lifeline, Doctors Without Borders, there were um, the people from CI sending ships. So in the end, we had a whole civil rescue fleet that was um, carrying out rescues on the Mediterranean Sea. And that worked pretty well. So the civil rescue fleet was able to save thousands and thousands of lives on the Mediterranean Sea. And that worked pretty well also because the coordination with the rescue coordination center in Rome worked pretty fine. Because during that time, also on the European side, at least some people thought, well, if people get in distress at sea, we should probably rescue them. That's also a normal thing. So could you imagine someone could have something against rescuing lives at sea? Well, probably you know the answer already. There is that, guys. I mean, that guy was pretty prominent in the media this year by um, uh, blocking civil rescue ships, but it also started a bit earlier. That guy, um, you might also know him, um, was the first one starting with the huge criminalization campaign against the civil sea rescue. So back in 2016, end of 2016, early 2017, um, there was a lot of rumors spreading about the NGOs on the Mediterranean Sea. What are they doing? Are they maybe colluding with the smugglers? And then there were some accusations that are pretty stupid. For example, there was the accusation that was widely spread that we would give light signals to the Libyan shore. I mean, we have nerds here, so probably you are pretty good in mathematics and in geometry. Um, so what do you think about the argument that there is the possibility of giving light signals to the Libyan shore if you are far out of territorial waters of Libya? So basically already from a geometry perspective, it's not possible to give that kind of light signals. Still, this accusation was widely spread. And, of course, that helped to let our donations drop and make our work much easier. Another um, uh, accusation I want to shortly talk about is the accusation that we would not um, destroy the boats we find. Because um, there was the accusation, if we find a rubber boat in distress, we have to destroy it. And uh, then it cannot be used again by smugglers. So there was the accusation we would not destroy them. I have to prove that we do so. So... That's how it looks like um, if we destroy boats. So basically, we have a lot of these accusations. And what do you think how this um, 
uh, contributes to the fact that we need um, a lot of nerds um, uh, to help us in um, uh, carrying out our mission. Why can nerds make our mission much safer? Well, because if we are able to document what we are doing at sea, if we are able to document the positions we are uh, on, if we can have a um, video of whatever happens at sea, then we can prove afterwards that these accusations are false. And that's why it's pretty important to have hardware technology um, on board our vessel. So that's one thing. However, the story continued, so these uh, kind of accusations were very effective. And so we ended up in a situation where the Juventa was the first ship to be confiscated. It's still confiscated. It was confiscated already in 2017. It's in Trapani now, and it cannot do its job anymore. And we thought, okay, we still continue, but then this year, a lot of other ships were confiscated. We have the case of the Lifeline that was very prominently in the media. The Lifeline is still confiscated in Malta. So it became much more difficult for the civil NGOs, and there was a moment where no civil rescue ship at all was left in the Mediterranean Sea. And of course, this has effects. So what happened basically was the people were still coming because, I mean, there was this argument of a push factor, uh, sorry, a pull factor. So um, there was the argument by um, the European states that only because there is civil sea rescue, um, the people are coming over the Mediterranean Sea and then they get rescued by the NGOs and then they get brought uh, to Europe. However, when there was no NGOs anymore, still people were coming, but there was just no one anymore to rescue them. So the effect of this fact um, we have seen in a pretty, pretty drastical way um, in uh, the September of this year, because before we had this number. Any idea what this number means? So this number is basically the death rate we had shortly before the NGOs were pulled out of the area. Um, so it was one in 44. So if one in 44 um, who tries to cross the Mediterranean Sea via um, uh, the Central Med would drown. When we had the last rescue ship, the Aquarius, um, stopping the operations because their flag was taken away in September, the number raised to one in five. So in September, when there was no civil rescue ship at all, we had one in five drowning who tried to cross the Mediterranean Sea. And to better imagine what it means if one in five drowns, you can just count uh, in the rows here, and you will recognize that it's a pretty horrible situation. And for this reason, of course, we try to continue sea rescue. These pictures are taken last week, because even though sometimes it's hard times at sea, we managed to get our ships, at least some of our ships, back into operation. And also, we got back into operation our planes, which we use for air surveillance. This picture is taken a year ago, um, but the aircraft just took off half an hour ago from Lampedusa to search the eastern part of the um, central Mediterranean Sea. And that led to a situation where we are able to act again. So on Christmas, um, or the weekend before Christmas, the first rescue uh, since, months, since months carried out by civil rescue operations took place. Those people are, by the way, still on the sea watch. But actually, we are able to operate. However, and that's also why um, we had a lot of stress the last days, coordination is pretty difficult. We now have a lot of groups involved in search and rescue. We have um, a, a difficult situation at sea, so it's um, sometimes not easy to understand what is going on. So communication is pretty important. So what can we do um, to not let this situation up, end up into chaos, like we can see on this picture? Um, uh, we need you, because um, uh, there, hardware and software can play a key role um, to make our operations much more efficient. So we'll start with the hardware. Um, I mean, if you have a ship at sea, hundreds of kilometers away from the shore, then there is no way to actually reach this ship 
by simple mobile phone. So satellite communication is the first and very important part of hardware technology we have to use uh, to make our uh, operations much more efficient. And how this works, we will later see in a live call, if it works out, actually. Um, and on the other hand, um, another pretty important part um, of the hardware components um, is that we need actually cameras and we need voice recording systems to, to be able um, to prove um, what uh, is going on at sea. So that's why we need you guys, um, because that's something I can't do. Then there's another thing. This is a Imarsat C technology. Um, uh, this is a basic satellite communication system uh, to communicate with ships at sea. Um, it's obligatory on all ships. And this is also a way to reach other ships than our own vessels, because it's not only civil rescue ships uh, on the Mediterranean Sea, it's also merchant vessels um, uh, or other ships that are just around. Um, we can contact through that. And why this is important and why we need you um, to help us solve some problems with this old um, uh, Microsoft DOS technology that is um, uh, combined with that. Um, that's also something Nick is going to talk about. And um, last but not least, what we also want to establish, and that's pretty important, is a civil rescue coordination center. Because in former times, when everything was running kind of okay, the rescue coordination center in Rome if they are aware of a case of distress, they would send a position to the civil rescue ship and they would coordinate everything. So they would have their charts, they would have all their screens and they would just deal with it and they would just only tell the civil rescue ships where to go and what to do. Since Salvini is in power, this just doesn't happen and so we have to do it ourselves. That's why uh, we think it's pretty important to have um, such a chart where we can plot all the distress cases, where we can coordinate it ourselves. This is for two reasons. One is to save human lives, and one is also to monitor the human rights situation uh, out at sea. So that's what Nick is going to tell you about um, what we need from the technical side. There, this comes into place again, because this is very old technology, and we need to combine it with new technology that looks like this, so we can use it together and yeah, that's basically um, the task we're going to talk about. And so at this point, I would like to hand over um, uh, to get some more details about the technical solutions. <laughs> yeah, hello. Um, I want to give you a short introduction. How it's like to be this ship system administrator. Uh, I spent two weeks uh, in September on the on the lifeline, and basically we refurbished. Uh, the whole ship's network. So a short introduction, again, the ship was built in 1968 as Clupea and was built by the, uh, for the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries of Scotland. And in 2015, it was uh, bought by uh, Sea-Watch. And then in 2017, it was bought by Mission Lifeline and is since operated by Lifeline. Well, and as you can imagine, in the last 50 years, a lot of uh, mechanics, engineers, and technicians botched uh, around the, the ship, worked, repaired stuff, and upgraded it. So um, in some parts, this feels like maintaining a le legacy software project. Um, the power supply, um, there are two generators on, on, on the ship. So in general, the stability and availability of, um, of the power is not as reliable as on land. So therefore, all devices which are essential for navigation and communication are battery buffered. Um, now I want to shortly cover uh, devices, sensors, and data providers you will find on board. So for navigation, we have a gyro compass, which is uh, basically a compass with, which gives the orientation on the, and, and a gyro with, which gives the orientation of the ship in the waves, because this always changes, of course. Then we have uh, GPS receivers, so this is the global positioning system, so we always need to find our current position. And we also have AIS transmitters and receivers. AIS is the, uh, AIS is the, um, oh sorry, I was so far away from the microphone. Um, AIS is the automatic information system, so this is basically a transmitter which sends out the, current, uh, the ship's name, the current position and the course, and this is also for collision uh, avoidance. 
Uh, furthermore, we have uh, weather data, which is fetched uh, online, and uh, for communication, we have standard radios and Iridium, a Visa uplink, and LTE, but I will cover that later. Um, and many of these devices need to be interconnected, so the autopilot, for example, needs access to the compass data, of course, and to the gyro, and to the GPS, and the AIS. Some of the radios need uh, AIS, and so basically we have lots of devices on board and a, a, a huge network and everything is connected with various uh, NMEA 0183 buses, which is essentially RS422, or NMEA 2000, which is essentially a CAN bus. So we have multiple of these in the ship to interconnect all the devices we find on the bridge. So furthermore, there's also an office on the ship. So there are printers, VoIP phones, a Wi-Fi network, Ethernet network, and we have lots of laptops with Linux. Um, furthermore, there's also there are IP cameras, as Ruben already told, and audio recording setup and network storage, because we might later need to prove what we did. So we need to record all our positions all, and all the cameras, um, what the cameras recorded from the deck and around the ship. Um, yeah, so... All of the computers uh, on, on, the, on the Lifeline are now provisioned with Ansible, which is a fast replacement in emergency situations, e.g., uh, for example, if the, the ship's, uh, the bridge computer with the navigation uh, crashes or just falls down due to heavy waves, so we can grab the media team's computer and make it a bridge computer within minutes. So, furthermore, um, Ansible has the great advantage that we uh, sort of have a documentation and for replacement crews, which have, happens every two weeks, um, it's comprehensible how the computers are set up. Also, documentation is uh, essential. If you build something without documenting it, uh, it's virtually non-existent. Or, and especially on a ship, this can be very dangerous. And life, in a, for example, in a life-threatening situation, if you need a handbook of a broken device and you have no power and no internet connection, this can be really uh, dangerous. So you need to document everything. Here we see the uh, storage compartment for the documentation, which is the whole row of, of, uh, of folders up there. And so everything is ordered by letter and number and so on. So it's easy to access everything because everything is on board. Um, also, a label printer is very helpful if you have a bunch of cables, as you saw in the previous picture. Uh, it's rather annoying to find out which cable belongs to which. And as there is no strength or storage compartment, but rather many small spaces and under seat benches and beds and cupboards, you need to be very organized um, to put everything in, in its spot at all times, or you will spend most of your time searching for your tools and materials, which is rather annoying to go up and down the, the small steps uh, on the ship all day long. And also it's rather inconvenient if you wake up the ship's engineer uh, because you need to access the compartment below his bed just to find out that the tool you are looking for was not there anymore because you put it somewhere else. So um, to give you an imagination, I'll show you a short video, hopefully. Ah, okay. Yeah. Hier ist das Engineers Office und hier befinden sich unter den Bänken noch diverse nervigere und größere Komponenten. Zum Beispiel ein zweiter ungetesteter Autopilot sowie diverse Originalverpackungen mit allerlei Krimskram sowie da hinten auch noch zwei Akkus für die USV, also falls sie mal getauscht werden müssen. Und hier sind noch diverse Antennenkabel, die meisten davon mit Endstecker, Glühlampen und allerlei Quatsch. <lacht> Sowie die äh, Spare IP-Kameras, die würde ich jetzt auch dann demnächst hier unten einlagern. So, um, yeah, well, I started also taking videos for documentation to show the locations of these compartments because it's not really convenient to uh, take, take pictures or write it down because then I can give the replacement crews a virtual tour of the ship without being on the ship myself and also the others don't need to be on the ship and I can show them around and then they can immediately ask questions. So I took another video. So, das ist die Brücke. Hier befindet sich die Furuno Radaranlage, also zumindest die Displayeinheit. Angeschaltet wird das Ganze hier mit dem Einschalter. Wie gesagt, die ist aktuell noch defekt. 
Ähm, genau, danach braucht die drei Minuten Aufwärmzeit und danach kann sie hier mit dem STBI Standby TX Schalter gestartet werden und dann fängt auch die äh, Antenne oben an sich zu drehen. Das Gegenstück zu diesem Gerät befindet sich dann hier drüben. Das ist die Remote Processing Unit, die im Prinzip hier unten mit einem DVI-Kabel und noch diversem anderen Gedöns verbunden ist. Hier dieses dicke Kabel, was hier rausgeht, das ist auch das, was zum Mast hochführt. Ähm, ähnlich wie diese ganzen Funkgeräte und so weiter. Und auch da vorne die beiden, Kanal 12 ist der Hafenfunk, Kanal 16 der Notrufkanal. Ähm, auch diese Antennen führen äh, zum Mast und deshalb gehen wir jetzt diesen Kabelbaum ab. Hier verschwindet das rein, alles hier oben in dieser Holzverkleidung, die ist abnehmbar, führt hier vor zu den Geräten. Also da ist auch äh, der Laptop, der zum Beispiel hier... Ja, yeah, okay, that's it, that's, it, that's it for that. So basically I was, for, for, as, as the videos were, were recorded in German, I'm shortly gonna explain what I, what I told. Basically I showed the, the radios and the, the radar system in the, in the bridge, which was located there. And also basically in the rest of the video we would, uh, I would show the, how the cables go through the ship to which positions. So, um, and lastly, uh, I want to quickly uh, introduce a project uh, Daniel made. Um, yeah, we faced the problem that the ship has multiple uplinks, as already explained, and we always wanted to select the currently best uplink. There are commercial solutions for this, um, and there's a talk about why we didn't use it. It's called Das Boot 4.0 by Stefan Gerling, and it was held at the MRM CDs this year, and it's available via Media CCCDE. So feel free to have a look at it. Um, so we have three uplinks. The first one is LTE, the thing every one of you has in, your, in his phone or her phone. So it has, it's very fast, but it has a limited traffic and is only available in ports or close to the islands. Then we have VSAT, which is satellite based. It has a flat rate, is slower than LTE, and is available on sea most of the times, but it needs a dish, and this dish always needs to be aligned with the satellite. So sometimes there are obstacles in the way, for example, the ship's pole, and then we have, have no fix. And also in heavy sea, sometimes we, we lose the link. And then we have Iridium, which is also satellite based, but doesn't need a dish, but just a regular antenna. Um, this uh, works m mostly all the time, but it's super expensive, like for a phone call, three euros per minute and 16 euros per megabyte. So um, we use this, no. Um, <laughs> we built a, a Dana built a setup, um, which basically is an APU board um, with an LTE modem, which is shown here. And it runs OpenWRT, an embedded Linux system for, uh, a, a, a Linux operating system for embedded devices and for we have two VPN in, endpoints in two different locations on land running OpenWRT as well and we set up wire guard tun tunnels between all devices and then the and then the, the uplink to be used is determined with OLSR which is a, a link state routing protocol and maybe uh, known to you from Freifunk because they also used to use it so basically if VSAT or LTE are available, also always the best link will be used and pr um, provided. And if LTE and v VSAT are gone, it will automatically drop to Iridium, but due to limited bandwidth and, uh, and the overhead, uh, we don't use the wire guard tunnels then anymore. But uh, actually, the setup worked very well for the last, for the last months, and the public availability uh, also, compared to, to the previous installs, uh, switch also uh, increased. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Nick. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm working with Sea-Watch. Um, we already had a talk like two years ago um, about developing the search and rescue application, um, which was basically like an application to provide sea to sea communication organization. That means we basically had the problem that at this time we're like a lot of NGOs working in this area. And um, yeah, we basically wrote like a geographical information system to coordinate between all those ships and to basically track our ships. Um, what we are like, yeah, or the problem we're having at this moment is um, that we have still some as uh, assets in the, in the rescue zone, but um, we don't have like a um, MRCC, that means like a res rescue coordination center, which is coordinating those cases. Um, 
So what we are basically thought, or what we are basically thinking is, all the assets that are MRCC, like a state-run MRCC already has, um, are already available. That means um, there are NGOs which are caring about emergency call telephone lines. So that means if people start um, from Libya right now, they are likely not call the Italian MRCC, so the Italian Rescue Coordination Center anymore, um, because it's yeah, like super likely that they will pass on this information to the Libyans. Um, so it's like more likely that yeah, like voluntarily NGOs are called and they are like trying to manage those cases without human rights uh, violations. That means they inform those ships which will, yeah, for example, not the Libyan Coast Guard, um, etc. So um, we also have like the, the assets already in place. That means as a maritime coordination center has the Coast Guard, etc., we already have uh, ships which are like able to rescue. And um, last but not least, um, the rescue coordination centers also provide like all the forensic stuff and also are like responsible for taking all the evidence. That's um, what we're doing right now for our ships. That means like um, with this application we're having running right now, we can track our ships all the time. That means like for example, we had, we had one incident um, where um, yeah, like uh, there was um, a rescue of the Libyan Coast Guard where uh, Sea Watch uh, was also involved, where like more than uh, yeah, around about 30 people died. And the first accusa uh, accusation of the Libyan Coast Guard was that we were in their territorial waters. It was like quite a fast thing to prove with our data. Like there's also like more neutral data on it, but we could like see super fast and with that and prove super fast and with that, that we weren't like never in the territorial waters in this incident. So this kind of stuff is super um, important also to then um, give it away to, to other um, organizations, for example, forensic architecture with then yeah, who then work with this data to um, yeah, display it nicely and also pass it on to possible um, yeah, law um, enforcement authorities um, which they, um, yeah, deal with it. So um, what we're doing right now, um, or what we're planning right now, is that we want to take this application and make it more to a um, land C um, organization software and that's really important. Um, we had the cases that there were boats in distress, especially like in the last months. And um, because of the situation that Italy, Italy is not feeling responsible anymore for those ships, um, um, we had the situation that commercial vessels, that means tankers um, and so on, um, had to rescue those people. And they were um, yeah, in the situation that they couldn't really get rid of the people as fast. Or like, yeah, so yeah how to describe it, they weren't allowed to go into Italy, um, which means that, for example, the Saros 5 one ship was forced to have around about 80 migrants, I guess, for two weeks on board um, without like really being prepared for it, while our ships were blocked in, in Malta. Um, so um, what's happening right now, if um, migrants are in distress, um, that it's super likely that those ships will not rescue them. So. Um, we already also had the um, reports from migrants who said that they were seeing ships when they were in distress and they just passed by. It's not clear if they saw them or not, but we are, yeah, it's, it's happening at this moment. So what we are trying to do is, um, as said, um, there's AIS, which is basically publicly available. So that means everybody can, can get this data. Um, and what we want to do is now we want to have a database of every ship which is passing through this area. So now we also want to take commercial vessels into our um, application so that we can, if we, um, yeah, if there's any incident, can afterwards see which ships were close by and even if we have reports what the ship looked like, etc., we can maybe find out what ship it were and then look if we can, yeah, provide um, information to law enforcement authorities to then maybe get forward with it. Um, so that's the basic idea. So. Can yeah. we go to the call? Yeah. So, as yeah. you have seen now, um, what, why we need this technique for, um, now we want to have a little praxis test and we are all curious if it's going to happen. So, um, what we are doing now is to call our ship, which is currently stranded at sea with uh, 32 people rescued um, already uh, six days ago. 
Um, uh, yeah, and um, it's pretty important uh, because, as you can imagine, there's now uh, negotiations ongoing, international negotiations. We are talking with governments, we are talking with cities, um, whether they take the people, and then um, we have to be constantly in contact with the ship to find a solution for these people, and that's why we need this technique, and now we're going to see if it works out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hello. <laughs> Um, hi. Yeah, hi. so. Um, Hello from Sea Watch 3. Hi from the Chaos Communication Congress. <laughs> How is the situation on board? Hello? So we are now 67-ish miles south of Malta. Hello? Yeah. On the 22nd of December... Shit, is this week? Yeah, just today. Fun. We rescued 32 people at distress at sea. We can hear you. <laughs> And we have been drifting and moving in international waters since. Cool. So, okay. so this see? is the people who survived inhumane treatment, abuse. <laughs> can you see the audience Does actually? The question? Can you see the Can you see the audience? Maybe we can um, uh, give um, uh, to uh, the audience. You can see the screen. Ah, we can okay. see the screen. <laughs> All right. So um, normally you should see the audience here listening um, to you guys. Um, however, if you can't see them, um, I can see them and I can refer. So, is there any questions you guys want to ask to the ship? Then it's your opportunity now. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, Someone with a question. Hi. Um, I was wondering when are you planning to go to uh, dock somewhere? Like, how does that work right now in the current situation? Because you have people on board, right? So you need to get them onto land, I'm assuming. So, um, I just repeat the yeah. question because I don't know if it um, uh, went uh, yeah, so to the ship. Got, uh, so basically, um, the question was, um, when are we going to dock? Yes. And how does it work? Yeah, um, I hope you can hear me now. Um, I have a big delay here. Um, our plan was to dock uh, quite a while ago after we rescued the 32 people from the boat in distress on the 22nd actually uh, we went back on the 23rd uh, towards north um, but the thing is that no european state especially not malta and italy who are the closest ports of safety would grant us permission to go into port so right now we are just uh, waiting for uh, any opportunity to go to a port of safety that is uh, in vicinity of our current position. <clears throat> Someone else question? Okay. Any more questions? <laughs> to the ship right now? Um, so, so you're looking for a place right now. Who are the parties you are talking to? Are you talking, are people on land talking to governments or are you guys on the ship directly communicating to ports? Who is talking to who for this? Yes. So basically the question was um, whether um, the ship... Um, I think at the moment... Every That was the delay, I'm sorry for that. Now we have to learn. <laughs> yeah, we have this. a huge delay here. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, um, so I think everyone, a lot of people are talking to a lot of people at the moment. Uh, our head of mission is constantly uh, in contact with the back office, but also uh, with the. Oh. 
If someone has a All right, question, I mean, raise your hand. And there you already can see how difficult it is to get this kind of connection established. And that's also why we need you, because anything that improves this situation, that we have to delay, that we don't get the picture, um, that's what we need you for. And then we have the people talking to governments, um, uh, driving speedboats to rescue people out of the uh, maritime distress. That's all we can solve. But this, what is happening here right now, that's what you have to solve. <laughs> Maybe there are questions as well for this group uh, here. Okay. We have two mics as well. You can raise your hands. I can run. Thank you, sorry. Uh, what was what happened if there were medical emergency right now on the boat? If were, were they allowed to dock then, or is it just with the doctors on if board? If there is a medical emergency, um, we normally uh, ask the closest MRCC that is able to provide a medical evacuation. That is normally carried out uh, either by a speedboat or by a helicopter. This happened, for example, last Friday when um, there was a medical emergency on the Open Arms, which is uh, the ship from our partner organization Proactiva. Um, there was a baby that um, was in severe, um, uh, yeah, in severe distress, and so uh, Malta, in the end, sent a helicopter to uh, fly the baby and the mother to Malta. However, it took quite some time, and in the first place, there was no authorization for even a medical evacuation, so even that um, becomes pretty difficult uh, in this times now. Someone else question? There are microphones, eh? one <laughs> and two. I can, of course, run around all the time. It's really good for my condition after a last a long night. So my question is, what do you do when you aren't allowed to like go to a port and um, when there are more people in, I mean, in danger on the sea? So. Is there a limit? I mean, there will be a limit on people you can take on the board, but do you have a second board where you pass the people on sea? Because, I mean, if you can't, like, get them on the land, what That's a pretty good question. I mean, that's what we are um, trying to solve at the moment, and um, uh, we don't really have an answer to this, because normally the law of the sea is pretty clear that people have to be brought to a place of safety as soon as possible after a rescue. However, currently, as you see, um, we are hanging around at sea, Skyping uh, with uh, the Chaos Communication Congress, uh, but there is no solution um, uh, where to uh, disembark the people. And also, at the same time, we have information about three boats in distress right at this very moment. And there is uh, our um, partner organization, um, CI, which uh, carried out a rescue uh, today morning. Um, uh, so. Um, yeah, we are trying um, to coordinate with them and with them. <laughs> so the ship is back, great. Um, yeah. Um, hi, so I'm not entirely up to date about the situation of the uh, singular uh, European countries. Uh, the last thing which comes into my mind was that there uh, was support from the Spanish government. Uh, did that change in the past few weeks and months? Or uh, are, are they still uh, supporting NGOs like yours? Do you want to go on the ship? What did Spain say? <laughs> Um, so we, for in our case, no. There is a, there was another rescue um, by um, Open Arms, the organization for active Open Arms. Um, over 300 people were rescued, and this is the ship that uh, carries the Spanish flag. So they headed naturally for Spain. Uh, our flag is that of the Netherlands, so our case is different. Um, as we said, the first, the, this is still ongoing. The whole negotiation of um, what happens when we get our flag country um, a safe board provided by them, and then we can go there. So in this case, this is Netherlands. And I think what is what is very important to say here is that uh, Spain itself hasn't been very supportive. I mean, Spain has its own uh, sea rescue going on at the Strait of Gibraltar, but. Um, there have been a couple of cities in Spain, especially Barcelona, where our partners from uh, Proactiva Open Arms are based also, uh, who have been very supportive. And so the Spanish government has 
bowed also, I think, to the pressure of the Spanish civil society, who like really, um, because Proactiva is pretty big there. Um, so the Spanish government has bowed a couple of times, but they wouldn't do this for anyone, and they didn't do it for us. If, even if we could have just handed over these 30 people we have on board to, the, to our Spanish partners at open arms, and they could have taken them. So it sounds like there's no real solution, and you, you have to negotiate this on a case-by-case -case basis. Is that actually like how, how it is? That's how it is, actually, unfortunately. Uh, number two, question for people on board. Uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, um, I, I really do hope that the 30 people on board are okay um, and they get sort of somewhere to land safely. Um, I'm curious about these uh, negotiations. Um, what kind of leverage can you apply uh, to, I suppose it's mostly shame governments into uh, letting you uh, dock? How, how do these uh, negotiations work? I mean, there's, um, beside of um, shaming the German interior minister, um, which we normally do on Twitter, um, uh, there is the law of the sea. And the law of the sea is pretty clear. And um, uh, we are currently living in a situation where basic rights are abandoned by the European states, which makes it pretty difficult. But um, at the same time, uh, this um, law basis is still in place. So what we also try to do is to remember them um, about international conventions they have signed, um, which basically state that there needs to be a port of uh, safety um, as soon as possible. And there is um, uh, actually um, obligations for states also to make that happen. So that's also part of the negotiations. However, as you, as you said, um, uh, there is not much um, left um, as leverage um, uh, than to publicly shame them uh, for just abandoning um, basic human rights uh, at sea. Sorry for all the questions. But um, maybe in addition to that, um, what we have seen and what was um, uh, a lot of leverage um, uh, was the Seebrücke movement um, we have seen in Germany because when we had um, uh, the first of these kind of standoffs um, uh, with the lifeline stranded at sea with uh, more than 200 people in front of Malta, um, uh, we thought, okay, if the governments are not reacting, if um, Seehofer just um, doesn't do his job, um, uh, we will do it more from a grassroots um, uh, way. So we talked to a lot of cities, we talked to several um, uh, federal states, and for example, Berlin um, uh, then said, well, yes, we would welcome them. And Berlin was the first um, uh, federal state to do it, and many others followed, so Hamburg, Bremen, um, Schleswig-Holstein, Thüringen, Brandenburg, everyone um, uh, all of a sudden said, okay, we would take some of those people. Um, and exactly the same thing is happening right now. So we had um, uh, quite some negotiations ongoing the last uh, two days with German federal states. And right now some of them, uh, again Berlin in the first place, um, said that they would welcome these people. And that even forced... Um, uh, the German Interior Ministry to make a very embarrassing tweet um, where they said that um, actually they are open for a solution but only if it's happening on European level um, because Germany already had taken I think 115. 115 people that were rescued at sea so big applause to Germany the biggest <laughs> and most rich country on the continent has managed to take 115 people not um, this month, this year. <laughs> this, this year, not this month, not this week, this year, the whole year. So, yeah, um, pretty embarrassing tweet by the interior minister. And um, we now try um, to pressure him a bit more um, by also involving other European states and um, uh, by trying to put pressure to at least take the 32 people where we think that should be possible. <laughs> While we have this expensive line open there, I suggest to yeah. communicate with them. <laughs> Okay, hi, uh, my name is Friedrich Beckmann, I'm from Seebrücke Augsburg. Um, we met with Seebrücke Augsburg, the CSU Fraktion from Augsburg uh, last week and we will meet Oberbürgermeister Griebel in, on 11th of February. 
And we wanted to, or what we are doing is, we explain the idea that uh, the city of Augsburg will ask the uh, Ministry of Interior in Bavaria um, to say we are ready and we are welcoming uh, people in distress which are on boats such that they can leave the boat and they could, you could enter Malta Harbor and they will just uh, fly over based on paragraph 23, so on humanitarian reasons. And um, do you think that would help if um, Augsburg would say, um, yes, that's a bright idea, we are ready to take uh, a number of people, like 100, 500, whatever, um, so that um, you can leave actually the, the ships? Ships, gonna answer? Oh, sorry. Um, could you? And like, as Ruben already said, um, the Zeebrugge movement and the whole um, the whole thing of solidarity cities is pretty much our, our biggest hope. It's, um, and I think this also goes together with the civil MRCC that um, the only the only solution that can be provided or that looks like promising uh, here is that the civil society takes over because the states are not gonna, we've seen this for like almost four years now out here that the states are just going uh, out of the zone, are not doing the rescues, are not taking the people, are actually hindering rescue operations. So the only, um, the only promising solution uh, is that the civil society really steps in and there we need like a, a lot of creative heads to, um, to, to find ways to operate, to keep us operative and to operate a distribution. Um, like the Zeebrücke movement did, uh, without, uh, and, and parallel to the, to the state authorities. Okay, so, um, I just heard we are a bit over time, <laughs> so, um, uh, I would like to thank a lot to the ship. Um, I hope you're doing well. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, so we would I think we're on the ship all a bit tired and exhausted, but uh, and we would love to be actually on the Congress, but uh, we're doing very well and also our guests are... Yeah, we, have a, we have a big deck that looks tiny bit like a tea house at the Congress. Uh, there is a lot of uh, music and conversation and singing and dancing and uh, all kind of nice things going on. Uh, so although we are such a rescue ship, we're not actually equipped for staying, for having guests for a longer time on board. Yeah. Uh, we try to make best of the situation. It's been, it's been seven days. We have wonderful people on board it's, who have been through horrible, unimaginable things. And we still manage to somehow dance together. So we're tired and it's hard, but it's also cool. We just learned there's one more question. <laughs> yeah, we can take one more question. If uh, uh, The counter is going probably but there. Number one, please shoot. Okay, so uh, first, thank you for the work you do. And my question is, practicality set aside, would your ships theoretically be able to um, leave the Mediterranean and enter non-Mediterranean European ports if there would be an opening? That is mainly a political question. I mean, uh, the thing is, non-Mediterranean, you did ask non-Mediterranean ports. Of European countries. Or of other countries than European countries. Uh, European or both. European countries. So maybe oh, yeah. For example. We, well, we could do this, and there has been a discussion, and actually uh, Malta <laughs> told us to go to Rotterdam, or some, there, there has been a, couple of people saying to us, you've, you've got a Dutch flag, so go to Rotterdam. We could do this, yes, but it would take ages. It would take up to two weeks to go from here to uh, Rotterdam and another two weeks to go back. So it would keep us out of the Zar zone far longer than we want to. And secondly, uh, we would have to go through the Bay of Biscay, which is now in winter 
uh, quite a rough place to be on the seas and uh, it would not be very nice towards our guests who are uh, on our off deck outside um, in a tent, in a huge tent actually, um, to go on the Bay of Biscay. I mean, the, the Mediterranean is treacherous enough every now and then, uh, going in worse waters like the Atlantic uh, at this time of the year is, would just be uh, irres irresponsible and, and um, uh, yeah. Yeah, and besides staying out of SAR zone and what Chris mentioned, uh, the wet, rough weather, other reasons, there is also high cost of doing such a thing. Be very costly to do that. So there, yeah, there are many, many, many are reasons why we... Also, the law says you have to go to the next, to the closest port of safety and not to some port on the other end of the world or on the other end of the con continent. Yeah, Gulf of Biscaya, I wouldn't advise you to do currently, actually. My experience, I know that. <laughs> um, guys, uh, I think we're going to close this session here because their counter was going running and it costs a lot of money, of course. Uh, I would love to uh, thank you there on, the, on board. And thanks here to Trolloflex. Thank you all. Thanks to Trollofix, Nick and Ruben. And thanks to the Vogue for setting up the video link. <laughs>